just of being able to present the man what God has put on my heart for the church, but for the body of Christ and for the kingdom as a whole. And I'm, I'm grateful to God because it is a familiar passage of scripture that we have been given, and the Lord has really opened my eyes to a number of things in this text. And I really want to share it in a way that bless and I pray that it will bless you and it has blessed me. Uh, but I want to make sure that it's also relevant and relative to where we are today. Is that something else I need to do? How many of y'all know she couldn't talk about people that I made notes? Amen. <laughs> so as we stand and read the word of God, we're going to be reading from Genesis the 18th chapter, verse 16 through 26. Genesis the 18th chapter, verse 16 through 26. Are you hearing this morning? Genesis the 18th chapter, verses 16 through 26. And you have a say amen. Amen. A couple of things to do for amen. You and Matthew are doing the wrong book, amen. <laughs> Genesis is the first book of the Bible. All you gotta do is open your Bible. If you have your phone, it's the first option on your list of books of the Bible. James translation of God's word, Genesis the 18th chapter, verses 16 through 26, the word of the Lord declares these words. And the men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? For adventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this matter, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous, Within this city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Amen. 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 You may be seen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So, for a few moments, I just want to deposit into your spirit what I believe to be a direct request from God in 2018. I simply want to make this request of you. Consider it, ponder on it, and also listen to what the request is about to ask. So the request is simply stand up if you're on the Lord's side. All right. All right. There is a very, very, very deep, 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 deep issue. And the deep issues that come alive today are those that have been put in our spirits years ago, and even in our presence. And today God is looking for people who are willing to stand up and speak out. We're looking for those people because in this day and time, there's so much trauma, there's so much despair, there's so much discouragement, there's so much devastation, there's so much destruction, and it's hard for people that know the Lord to get a word in edgewise. But the reason why our voices are so silent and even faint is because many of us are unsure whether or not we are on the Lord's side. Just coming to 
church is not evidence that you're on the Lord's side. Just lifting your hands in the sanctuary is not enough to declare whether you're on the Lord's side. Just carrying your Bibles or even saying amen is not enough to, disperse, to, to declare that you are on the Lord's side. Because being on the Lord's side is not about words. Being on the Lord's side is not about being in specific places occasionally. Being on the Lord's side means that there is a constant relationship and effort to build relationship with the Most High God. And you are yielding yourself, your body, your mind, and your soul to Him and Him alone. There's no competition. There's no confusion. But you have determined that you are going to stand up no matter what happens, no matter when it happens, no matter why it happens, and no matter where it happens. Those are the true soldiers that God is calling for in these last and evil days. And these are the last and evil days. But as we declared last week and we declare this week, Solomon, the most wise of all kings, told us that there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing going on today in 2018 that has not already been done. That has not already been experienced. That has not already been spoken. There are a few things that are going on now through divine revelation that God is showing us. But the wickedness of the world is a continuous cycle. And the very things that we're seeing today are the things that we have seen from the beginning. Amen. So the amazement here is how is it that the church, the people of God, the body of Christ, though that they've been outlined and declared as part of God's army, how is it that we stand in surprise and amazement of the wickedness that is happening around us and we're not urged nor are we up? We have encouraged to say something about it in a way that does not devalue someone but lifts them according to God's plan for their lives. We have to learn how to help people help themselves without hurting people. Say it. I like that again. We have to learn how to help people to help themselves without hurting them. And the church has been given the charge of being the mouthpiece and the vessel and the voice for God in this season. And God has given us one thing as our measure. It is not our church affiliation. It is not our denomination. He says to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know that you are my disciple because you have loved just money, not just popularity, not just prestige, not this or that, that you have love one for another. Yes, so it is our most difficult challenge to be able to see people as God sees them. It's our most difficult challenge to be able to embrace people for who they are as God embraces them. It's our most difficult challenge to resist the desire to judge somebody based on the way they're dressed, the way they have their hair, the way they wear their clothes, the way they speak, the way they walk, even through their disabilities. And God has not given us the responsibility to judge, but as the Word declares, He's given us the responsibility to teach and to preach and to declare His gospel in a dying world and to love people unconditionally so that they can be drawn to Him through our relationship. So we chose this morning to talk about Abraham. Because if you're going to be on the Lord's side, there are three things that you have to know. First thing that you have to know is God uses ordinary people to do his will. Yes, he does. I'm glad. A lot of times we think that we got to be super. In order to be used by God. But you don't have to be super to be used by God. Amen. But you do have to be submissive. Amen. Let me say that again. Amen. You, you don't have to be super because that when I don't feel super, when I don't reach a certain status in life, I should not think that I've been excluded, being used by God because God is not moved by our status. That's right. God is not moved by what we've accomplished or what we've achieved. God is not moved by how much money we have or what kind of car we drive. God is not moved by where we shop. God is not moved by where we stay. God is not moved by how many people we have around us or our popularity status. But God is moved by our compassion and our willingness to be submissive to His will for our life. God is moved by our faith. And our faith is what moves God into place to be able to use us as a vessel to do what? Help other people. Because this is about helping other people. Right. And God uses people to do his will. Abraham is the first champion or the second champion in the Bible to really step up and be used by God. Now, by the time you get to this 18th chapter of Genesis, there are a number of things that have happened. Uh, great things that have happened. In fact, the big things that have happened already. Adam and Eve have 
been put into the garden through creation. And they've also fallen. And now they've been removed out of the garden. By this time, the first murder has taken place. The spirit of jealousy has entered into the world through sin. And we know that jealousy is a dangerous weapon. Yes, if jealousy led to the first murder, then we have some solutions about why people are doing what they're doing. And jealousy and envy are culprits behind people's unwillingness to accept people for who they are. But more importantly, jealousy and envy are drivers that the enemy uses to bring us to, to bring us against each other, to make us feel that we have to be at war rather than at peace. Because of that, sin has gotten out of hand. And as sin grows more and more and more, and people begin to do more and more, God has gotten tired of it. And by the time you get to the sixth chapter of Genesis, God says to Noah, who is another ordinary brother, he says to him that, that the sins of the world have come up and I can't take it anymore. He repented me that I created man, and God chooses to destroy the earth. He doesn't destroy Noah and his family. Noah and his family are left to do what? To continue the works of God because God uses ordinary people. But what we learn from this text is no matter what and no matter who you are, sin is going to always be present as long as people are present. Yeah. God destroyed the entire earth, left eight people there. And from those eight people, the, the, the idea of sin and the works of sin continued on because Noah was a champion of faith just as Abraham is a champion of faith. And Noah realized that even though he was a champion of faith, he still had some struggles. Because we all have struggles. A lot of times all we hear about is Noah building the ark and we hear about Noah preaching for 100 years. But I want you to understand something about human nature that you may or may not understand. When you do something great, there's going to always be somebody coming after you. When you choose to do something positive, there's going to always be a negative force working against you. So Noah was, was trying to do what God called him to do. He's built this ark, and in building the ark, which is a phenomenon in itself, Noah talks about a subject that has never come up in the earth, and he talks about it raining, and it has never rained on the earth. He's preaching about something that has never taken place. So surely, people are like, man, you got to be crazy. Rain, it ain't never been no rain. What is rain? But God uses ordinary people in order to prepare you for what God is getting ready to do. He gives you somebody to relate to so that hopefully and prayerfully you'll listen to the voice of your peer, especially when you don't have a relationship with your God. Say that. Noah builds a ship. Storm comes. I'm always moved by the story because the Bible says that the animals begin to appear. Two of every kind of animal shows up as God is preparing to close the ark. That in itself should move anybody to wondrous because God sent in two of every kind of animal. Who decided which snake would go? Who decided which alligators would show up? He decided that which lions and tigers and bears, oh my. He decided how, where, and when. But the greatest part of that exercise is that the animals responded to his voice. The people didn't respond. The animals did. God created everything. And he created everything to respond to him. And when sin crept in, it created a barrier between us and God to the point that when God speaks to us as his creation, we don't respond as we should. I want you to know Noah had a problem. We don't know whether the problem existed prior to or after the fact. But as soon as the flood was over, Noah got back to his life. Bible says that Noah got drunk one night. <coughs> Don't y'all judge Noah, amen. That's right. Because everybody's got a head to wine on this family, amen. Yeah, right there. <laughs> Never seen Uncle Billy sober, amen. We all got one, we all got one. But that was evidence of Noah's ordinary behavior because we all have struggles. And so by the time Noah is, 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 is back in the saddle, he, 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 he loses 
humbles himself and his struggle and the weight of being Noah has come upon him. He gets intoxicated. He goes to sleep and watch this. While he's there, his children come in and, and they see him uh, naked. And that is an offense. Because we don't know what we do when we expose our, our struggles to our children. Say that. Say that. I wish I could unpack that. Your first, your child's first experience with most things started with you. That's right. We can blame it on television. We can blame it on school. We can blame it on the community. We can blame it on the city. We can blame it on the, the housing project. We can blame it on a whole lot of things. But their first experience with everything that they know typically starts in the home. Yes, it does. Both good and bad. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. So if we take responsibility for that, things will change because now I don't have to blame people for what my child is doing as long as I'm willing to take responsibility and be accountable for what they're doing. God has given me the power to do what? Go in and reclaim because through forgiveness and repentance and reconciliation, I'm able to go back and reclaim what has been lost through that process. That's right. We don't take time to reconcile. We don't take time to go back and reclaim. We don't take time because we don't want to accept responsibility for what we have done. Watch this. It was at a point in Noah's life where he exposes the sin to his family. Even though he's a champion of faith, he had his struggles. Even though you're an average church boy, even though you're somebody that loves the Lord today, at some point in your life, you have messed up, fallen, made a mistake, somebody saw it, somebody heard about it, and they lost their way because of it. Get over it. Back in God's will, and let's keep moving on. Right. And don't deny it because you're saved. Being saved does not eliminate you or exclude you from falling. Yeah. If it did, you would not have to have written now unto him that is able to keep me from falling. As long as I'm wrapped in flesh, as long as the monopoly is upon me, I have the capacity to do wrong. In fact, if you read your Bible, you'll find it's easier for me to do wrong than right. That's why God has to push harder for me to do right. Because as long as I'm wrapped in flesh, I have the capacity to sin. And I sin every day. Sometimes yeah, yeah. it just don't come up on the radar. Come on now. James writes that we sin in our thinking. Even before we move into action. And so many of us spend all day and all night and all our lives trying to obey the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> but what we fail to realize is the creator of all men, the creator of heaven and earth, the Bible says he sits high and looks low, that he's always available, he's always awake, he's always aware, and the Bible Oh, my God. 
God knows all this about Abraham, right? And we get to chapter 18 and, and first of all 17, and God changes his name from Abram to Abraham. Because now God is ready to move him into his purpose. God has to identify him with his name, and his name identifies him with God's purpose for his life. So you need to really ask yourself, what is the meaning of my name? Why was I given this name? I believe God is telling us today that our name is as our the purpose is to this wrapped up in who we are and not only God's children, but who we are in the earth. He not only changes, oh I love this, he not only changes Abraham's name, he changes Sarah's name. Because you can't do for one and not do for the other. Say that, say that. Let me just talk to the married couples for a minute. When you get married, you become one. Say one. One. When God does for you, he's also doing for the other person. God won't bless you if the other person is left out because you are one. Just as we are one with God, we are one with our spouse. And so when there's a blessing, we are one. When there's a curse, we are one. When there's a problem, we are one. When there's a reward, we are one. When there's a situation, we are one. When there's a circumstance, we are one. When there's a solution, we are one. When there's something going on in the atmosphere, we are one. When I'm hurting, we are one. When I'm healed, we are one.
parents and my house when I was growing up. And all those spirits try to jump on us as the children. Because you need to know the children are vulnerable and they don't know how to discern. That's right, say that. And they trust Uncle Bobo. Because you told them Uncle Bobo is okay. Well, what you don't know is Uncle Bobo is not good for them. And if you're not able to discern that Uncle Bobo is not good for them, when you go to work and leave Uncle Bobo there with your kids and think that Uncle Bobo is watching them, he is watching them, but I don't know where you think he's watching them. Yeah, yeah.
how you share. What's behind his mind? What's yours is mine. It's not the attitude. That's not how you share. What's mine is yours and what's yours is ours. Abraham entertains him. He includes Sarah. Here's the spiritual side of it. The Bible says that the men repeat exactly what God has already told Abraham. That you're going to be the father of many nations and that, that Sarah is going to have a baby. Here's the miracle. They were both now older and Sarah was now 90 years old. And Abraham was almost 100. Tell your neighbor, it's impossible. It's impossible. With men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God waited until then, until it was beyond, as Sarah said, beyond my physical capacity. And when the word comes out that she's going to have a baby, here's her testimony. Shall I have pleasure again with my man? Preach, that's up. What is my responsibility in this 
temptation. And let me just to step aside and let me do my work. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we gotta learn how to keep our mouth closed until the right time. And then when it's our time, we gotta know how to speak up and speak out. We gotta confuse. We're speaking out and speaking up before it's our time. And then when our time comes, we've talked so much in the wrong way that nobody wants to hear what we gotta say. However, he's connected Abraham to these people through service. Say service. Service. The reason why Abraham is at the table, y'all, is because Abraham was willing to be a servant. So what gets you to the table? Not your name. Not your degree. Not your money. Not your intellect. What gets you to the table is your willingness to serve other people. Yes. 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 Let me say that again. Yes. Yes. There are tables where decisions are being made. Yes. God plants people at the table yes, does. Yes. based on their willingness to serve. That's yes. right. Because if you are arrogant, Come on, if you are high minded, high -minded. if you got the wrong attitude, well, God can't use you at the table. If I don't use you at the table, you gotta be humble. Yes. You gotta be a servant. Yes. You gotta be a listener. Yes. You gotta be a willing vessel. Yes. You gotta know when to speak and when to be quiet. You gotta know when it's your turn and when it's not your turn. You gotta know that God doesn't care about who else is at the table. What he does care about is he's gonna put you there that you're willing to follow his lead. Let yes. me hurry along. I'm getting too excited. My God, there are too many seats at the table because nobody wants to be a servant. Everybody wants to be served. Everybody wants to be recognized for their accomplishments, for their resume, for their accolade, for their anything that they've done. I want to be recognized for those things. God can't use you because your agenda gets in the way of God's agenda and God don't have time to wait on you to come down. Okay. Hurry it on.
Will 
needs to intervene to step in. You know things are not good. What are you talking about before the Lord? You know your family is dysfunctional. What are you talking about before the Lord? You know your cousin needs saving. You know there's a dope house down the street and you can't find it. What are you doing so that God can give you the insight on how to go in and get your cousin?
restore, that I'm praying for them on a daily basis. So if you decide to restore them, if you decide to save them, if you decide to rescue them, it's because I believe in Jesus and Jesus is interceding on my behalf. I'm interceding on their behalf. So the intercessor has an intercessor that's interceding on our behalf. And the chain line is that intercession is the priority. And I'm praying for him, he's praying for me, and Christ is praying for all of us. And it's about that we need to be about. The Bible says, if my people, which are called by my name, to humble themselves and pray and to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, then shall I hear from heaven, forgive their sins, and heal their lands. What's the problem? We're not praying. What's the problem? We haven't humbled ourselves. What's the problem? We haven't asked God to step into the situation. So we have sickness. We have disease. We have destruction. We have devastation in the land that God said he would heal if we only took the time to pray. Here's the sad part about the text. And this is what I see today. God told Abraham, I will find you. Look for him, 50 people. Take note, because I didn't see this until I started studying this. For many years I preached from this text that Abraham went to Sodom to look for 50 people. And so, because Abraham didn't have the capacity to find 50 people. God said, I will go down. Let me say it again. God said, I will go down. And if I find 50 people that are standing for righteousness, I will spare the entire city. God came back and said, hey, I'm sorry, baby. Then find 50. Abraham and his citizen, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. If there are 45 down there, we will save the city. God said, I will go down and look for 45 people. If I find 45, Abraham, I'll save the city. God came back and said, sorry, Abraham didn't find 45. Abraham said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. If, I, if, you, if, if there are 40 people down there, we'll just save the city. God said, if I find 40, Abraham. I'll spare the 